Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's latest webinar series. Today we've got David Detrick, who's going to present to us about managing our waterways and aquatic ecosystems through multivariate river health assessment. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So David, Detrick is our presenter today, and he's a principal environmental engineer and a specialist in numerical modeling. So thanks very much, David, for presenting today. A little bit about David. So Dr. David Detrick has over 25 years experience in river health and aquatic ecosystem water quality monitoring, assessment and management. He is an accredited Oz Rivers practitioner in Tasmania, Victoria and Northern Territory and has worked for Rio Tinto, Tasmania EPA, Northern Territory EPA and Earth Systems and has helped develop the tropical Oz Rivers River Health Protocol amongst other guideline development for the Australian, Northern Territory and Tasmanian governments has been involved in several complex system-wide river health assessment programs, including the Derwent Estuary Program, the Melville Bay Marine Health Monitoring Program, the Darwin Harbour Water Quality Protection Plan, and mixing zone management at more than 100 major industrial outfalls around the world. He has worked extensively throughout Australia, Africa, and Southeast Asia. And how did David get to this position? For some of you youngies on here today, it wasn't an easy journey, lots of study as well. So David's background in education was he studied initially at Monash University, doing civil, civil and environmental engineering. Then uh, at UTAS, he did a Master of Science in which was focused on aquatic ecology and environmental technology. And finally, he did his PhD in soil gas transport at the University of Melbourne. So a long, hard slog of education there to complement what's a pretty impressive range of hands-on experience. So without further, ooh, no, I nearly forgot. Uh, a couple of other things before we get started. We love your questions. So please use the Q&A button at the top of the screen to raise those questions and I will read those questions out at the end and David will do his best to answer them. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? We like to share knowledge, we like to facilitate education and we like to lead industry. Speaking of such things, we've started an education program and uh, our first training course, which we're doing in collaboration with ALGA, which is the Australian Land and Groundwater Association, is on groundwater sampling. So please feel free to reach out if you've got some graduates or experienced field techs who want to be uh, trained formally in groundwater sampling and we can run them through that course. So without further ado, I will pass over to David and many thanks, David, for sharing some of your knowledge today. No problems, Richard. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Excellent. Well, welcome aboard, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, one of the most complex um, issues that humanity has to grapple with, which is managing our aquatic ecosystems with multivariate river health assessment. Aquatic ecosystems are very interesting on planet Earth because they're probably the most biodiverse habitats on the planet, and they're also the smallest in area, and generally uh, the most impacted because all people need water everywhere around the world. Uh, so next slide, Richard. Okay, so this is a graphic that just sort of tries to outline the various 
uh, major subjects in a classic multivariate river health program. Um, we've got uh, fish sampling. We do fish community sampling. So we try to get an assemblage of species from each watercourse. We also have them filleted and send fish fillets off for uh, toxicant tissue sampling analysis in various labs around the world. We do sediment and substrate uh, sampling as well. And again, that data goes off um, for ICPMS in various labs around the world to collect metals, majors and trace elements, uh, which are important for toxicity assessment. We also do water quality, both field and laboratory. So we're doing metals again and trace elements um, and nutrients. Um, we also do an assessment of riparian and aquatic uh, vegetation. Riparian assessments done by a terrestrial um, ecologist and the aquatic vegetation is usually done by an aquatic ecologist. Then we do some macroinvertebrate sampling, um, which generally follows the Oz Rivers style framework for people who are uh, uh, familiar with Oz Rivers sampling protocols. Then we also look at climate and stream flow, um, usually for the 12 months before the program, just to get a feeling for what kind of climate and stream flow effects may have impacted on the aquatic uh, ecosystem that we're managing. Okay, this presentation is going to be in two main parts today. We've got uh, a bit of a discussion about uh, multivariate program design and data sampling. And then we've got the, uh, the engine room of it, which is data testing and multivariate analysis. Okay, part one, program design and data sampling, arguably the most important aspect to get it right before you do it. So multivariate sampling design usually in, invokes BACI, which is the classic before after control impacted site selection uh, process. And that's essential for statistical analysis of impact. Um, as you can see in the graphic, before is basically before anything occurs. It's a more natural system upstream of the generally point source activity, point source discharge activity, such as a mine site, factory, uh, city, waste management facility, etc. Then you have the after point, which is uh, downstream of that activity. And you also have the impact point, which is monitoring directly at the impact. So we can have a transition between a mixing zone at the impact and the after site. And then arguably most important of all is the site in purple there, which is the control site. So when we're trying to assess potential impacts from drought or other climactic impacts or even land use impacts, which might be upstream at the before, at the before point, we can look at the control site. Selection of the control site, usually is done in such a way as that it's an area not going to be impacted by human activities, which in, in these days is becoming increasingly hard to find, but it's still, when you've got a good control site, it's good to hang on to it. Um, I've got the four S's here, my four S's, which I find important in this kind of multivariate sampling design, statistical program design, how to remove external bias from the data. And of course that involves so selection of a great control site and doing all of the same tests at the control site as we do at the other three sites. Um, site selection uh, is very important to be done based on uh, a whole bunch of stuff, but the macroinvertebrate habitat types, riffle, pool and edge habitat are quite important. And there's also four velocities, slow, fast, slow, deep, um, fast, deep, um, etc. Very important to grab in that, that section. Site access is really important. You've got to carry quite a bit of equipment and people. Quite often we do these studies with more than 10 people in the field. So you need a couple of four wheel drives. And if the four wheel drives can't get there, you've got to be prepared to walk. And some of the stuff we do in places in Africa gets quite hot. So you really need to think about uh, hydration and keeping people cool. And then finally, which is also interrelated is the safety issue, flash flooding, flow velocities, flow depths, dangerous animals working in and around water issues. So they're all important. Next slide. Just before you do, so how often do you actually have an adequate control site? Um, we try to have one in every program, Richard. The, the key word there is adequate. <laughs> and look, sometimes the control is adequate for one year. And then we've literally in in places like Laos, we've had we've had local communities come in and do shifting agriculture straight through our control site. And the control site's literally gone from a site that scores sevens and eights 
and then 12 months later scores four and in, in one program actually scored lower than all of the before after and impacted sites so we we try to have a control site every single time but in some countries it's very difficult because um, of land ownership land uh, land use styles um, Laos is a very communist tribal country so any piece of land can be used almost at any time it's controlled for instance by the seven year farming cycle richard so you've really got to try and work around that the other way to do it is to also if, if your client does actually own other pieces of land around the place which they can control access to it's quite often a good idea to try and grab a site which has been fenced or something which has got a, a small creek or a piece of a river in it and try and use that control to control the control but yeah it's it's a difficult thing to do and i think as the human race becomes more and more populous it's going to get more and more difficult all right thank you okay climate and stream flow data essential to really figuring out what's going on and to assess interannual variability in all of your data sets. Um, annual rainfall provides runoff for river flow, obviously, and can be affected by drought and wet years. You can see on the graph to the right, uh, we've marked on the 10th percentile dry, 90th percentile wet years and the median. And you can see there's quite a few years which are one in, you know, below a one in 10 drought. There's quite a few years that are quite wet. And these kind of things do impact uh, variations in flow depth create variations in aquatic habitat area so it can change the the position of edge habitat can um, change the amount of sediment in in pools and riffles uh, variations in flow velocity can create different sediment sediment deposition rates so if you for instance got very low flows during drought uh, the, the low velocities can mean that um, you've got a lot of sediment depositing in riffles that would not normally deposit in riffles because the velocity in the riffle is much lower and velocity in riffles is usually one of the highest velocities in a small stream uh, and, and large rivers. Climate and flow records are therefore very useful for assessing this interannual variability and, um, and it's very important to apply them particularly to your control site data. If you've got uh, an evident signal in your control site data, then you can use that to uh, modify your, um, your impacted and upstream downstream sites. Next slide. Okay, riparian habitat assessment uh, is uh, quite complex. You really need a pretty experienced terrestrial and aquatic ecologist to undertake this well. Uh, we, we always make sure we get local experts in as uh, field team contractors because they always have the best knowledge of sites. Um, you can very quickly and easily get some detailed data about, you know, change in your riparian habitat. And that's one of the most crucial things to know about in relation to what's happening to bug communities in the river. And you can see you can make quite good graphics like we've got on the right there. We can see slight shifting change over, over the years from Habitat, uh, habitat loss, and also in some cases from uh, quite large droughts. We've, we've been sampling sites recently that have had some pretty, pretty big droughts, one in 50 year droughts that have spanned over two to three years. Next slide, Richie. Okay, the visual aquatic habitat uh, assessment is focused around the actual uh, aquatic ecosystem of the river itself. We always use the Oz River's visual habitat assessment protocols, and that's derived from various US EPA visual assessment protocols, Fab Sims, and a few others. Um, there's a long history of development and research in this area. US EPA has been doing this since the 70s. Australia has been doing it since the 90s. I think Europe's finally catching up now in the noughties, and uh, a few other places, uh, Africa and Asia, are tending to look around and use whatever seems um, available for their particular um, use. We do a lot of Oz rivers in Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, assessor training in this is essential. So I train up our um, Earth Systems guys and we have to show reproducibility in their scores when they're assessing the ecology visually. Um, and I think you need to do a lot of checking of their scores each year. And you need to look at things like drift because we've found that different assessors, one thing that comes out of the statistics actually is that you can actually pick up different assessors from their different scores. And you may need to actually correct some scores. Basically it's in the personality of a person. Some people are very optimistic. 
Some people are less optimistic and their scores kind of reflect that. Some people also even like different colors, Richard, which is extraordinary. And they'll score, score areas that have a particular color regime differently to another area that has a different color regime. So there's all sorts of stuff to look out for in that. Um, next slide. So before we do, so if someone wanted to get trained up in that methodology, do you know where they can go? Yeah, um, eWater is running various Oz Rivers training courses for Australia. Um, and it, it is, I think that's pretty much one of the only training sources for Oz Rivers. Uh, if you Google Oz Rivers training, something should pop up. Um, I'm certainly not current in that area, but the last time I looked, which was a few months ago, eWater was coordinating a lot of the Oz Rivers training packages for Australia. And there's kind of a national training package and each state will have its own Oz Rivers protocol. So you'll need to make sure that you're also um, getting your local state's accreditation as well, which might be another training course entirely. And you said there's bias in the way they, they collect it between individuals. Um, it, it sounds like kind of tricky for you to really determine that bias, like unless you're duplicating up on the same plots you're assessing. And then... Yeah, and this is where having a ton of photography really helps, Richard. So I encourage the teams, I mean, I'm always with the teams, of course, but I encourage the teams to take a lot of photos. So one of the data sources, which I haven't talked about many times in this, um, this uh, short webinar is photography. Generally, we will have something between 400 and 500 photographs of say 10 sites to look at. Those photographs will be across rivers, upstream, downstream from each site, detailed shots of substrate, detailed shots of any kind of habitat differences, woody debris levels, riffles, pools, all the habitat types. And what I can do is jump into those photos and then check a score from a person. And then I can actually make, I can actually do a, a like a desktop scoring myself and then I can actually compare my desktop score to their actual field score and then we can use that to assess drift and correlate where we need to. So essential to collect uh, field photography and in the era of mobile phones with with GPS locked into the, the picture there's no excuse for not taking enough photos really. Okay, fish community sampling. Again, you need a fish ecologist really to get this done well. We've done it, uh, there's two photos there. You can see there's two ways of doing it. One is electrofishing, which is the bottom image. And the above one is um, sane, fish, sane fish net uh, collection. Um, we basically choose one or the other based on conditions. Um, we found in some of the remote areas of the world that electrofishing is almost impossible because high temperatures are very bad for batteries. You have a range of different um, salinity in the rivers and streams, and that really impacts on setting the thing up. Uh, so it can become very um, complex and unwieldy at times to use. And if you've only set up for an electrofisher and it breaks down, then suddenly you don't get any actual fish, which is something to really think about. So I would definitely, if I was going to do electrofishing, I would be taking nets just in case you have a tech failure. Um, but in a lot of areas, we've actually moved towards sane fishing because that's basically what local people would use. So if you're essentially trying uh, to work for a client uh, or a government department and you're trying to assess river health, one of the key issues is how much of the local fishery is being consumed by the local inhabitants. And so if you're using nets and other similar methods to catch the fish, that's replicating what the locals would be doing in their spare time and possibly to get food. So it's a very good way to look at catch per unit effort and other things like that that we would use to assess the fish community. Um, we do need to look at fish for food safety requirements. If you've got industries which are potentially dis discharging toxicants which can bioaccumulate, you do need to look at food safety requirements. In many places in the world, when we work in the mining sector, we find that artisanal miners are actually illegally attracted to the uh, functional mine site and they quite often mine upstream and downstream. And increasingly, our job is to actually uh, separate the large scale miners impact from the small scale messy impacts of the artisanal miners. Some of the artisanal miners use a lot of mercury to process gold, etc. So we're finding increasingly uh, mercury levels in watercourses again, which is very unhappy for me because I've had a lot of experience in picking up trace mercury in the west coast rivers of Tasmania, for instance, which has come from gold mining in the 1860s, which is um, 
very sad to see it popping up again. So food safety is huge. And um, because of fish migration, however, their ability to move away from pollution, we can't really use fish community data to assess impact because as soon as there is an impact, the fish are basically gone within hours. So it's not a great way to assess impact. I mean, one of the things you can look at is presence absence. If there's no fish there, when there was fish there, then obviously something's happened. But as pollution in, impacts in rivers are generally a matter of hours and then they're washed downstream, the fish will generally come back. So you'll just miss the pollution entirely. Um, but there is great relationships between water quality, sediment quality and fish tissue, which need to be followed through with. Because if you find something in a fish tissue, that can trigger a bit of research in both sediment, water quality and other things. Next slide, Richard. Do you use eDNA? Do we use what? Sorry, Richard. eDNA? No, oh, we've, we've thought about using DNA. Um, one of the big issues is cost for us. And the other big issue is actually customs importation of biological material. It's, um, there's a lot of messing about to get uh, live stuff across borders. Uh, and because we're doing a lot of work in Southeast Asia and Africa, it's just easier to basically get bugs and things like that, fish uh, and uh, vegetation samples actually sampled uh, it, by local experts, Richard. They're quicker, faster. It's also creating local employment, which I think is really important, and giving uh, local education and research um, opportunities for university people. So we have a lot of PhDs and master's people generally supporting us in the field, in the fish and in the macroinvertebrate area. And we try to do a lot of capacity building locally as well. So we don't do a lot of DNA work. Um, if I was in Australia and doing it in Australia, I would consider using it for specific targeted issues. But um, it's not officially part of an Oz Rivers uh, protocol. In an Oz Rivers protocol, you're doing a live pick in the field and you're actually picking out the bugs as you see them from a white tray for a timed period, which is often 20 minutes. And then that that is actually part of the statistical sampling um, uh, stratum for the macroinvertebrate procedure. So I guess the short answer is no. The long answer is yes, I'd love to. Uh, and the longer answer is, but it's very difficult to arrange. <laughs> Okay, next slide. You're on it. Uh, okay, macroinvertebrate sampling. So again, we've got um, several protocols available for macroinvertebrate sampling. We prefer to use OzRivers because um, it's a really good protocol, has holistic training, and you get um, the people who are trained up in it get a certificate saying, I can do OzRivers training. We've got the three key habitats there on the right-hand side, edge habitat, uh, pool habitat and riffle habitat. Um, you're basically using a kick net to do the sampling. And the way we do it is we reduce our 100 metre stretch of river, which is the site that we're trying to monitor at all four sites, the, the backy system. We try to take that 100, 100 metre piece of river and we just we break it up into 10 metre representative sections. So if there's two pools in that 100 metre section, we try to do five metres in one pool and five metres in another pool. If there's three riffles, we try to do three metres in one riffle, three metres in another riffle and four metres in a bigger riffle to try and represent those different habitat types within our 100 metre representative patch of river. Uh, the great thing about bugs is they move very little. They're demersal and immobile generally. Quite often bugs will only move one to two metres within their riffle or edge habitat during their larval phase. Um, they're seasonal, so they tend to breed in um, either spring or autumn uh, planetarily, which is interesting. And they're also the family level. At the family level, there seems to be very similar species globally, which is also a really interesting thing that I've realised in the last five years, particularly when I've re-looked at some of my bug samples from Africa and Asia and Australia. They're, at a family level, um, the niches in ecology are all filled by very similar bug types. So it's interesting. Um, and as a result of them not being, moving very much at all during their life cycle, they're very useful for detecting water quality related impacts for up to six months after a pollution event, which is fantastic because as you would know, if you do water quality sampling, uh, within hours, a pollution event can be gone from a river. So if you're not there when it's occurring, exactly when it's occurring, 
you're not going to be able to pick it up with a conventional field water quality test or a laboratory uh, uh, water container because it's going to be gone. And I've I've seen this happen. We, we've seen some um, artisanal mining where a, or a bulldozer pushes a whole range of dirt into a river, and it's it it will be red for ten minutes, and then suddenly ten minutes later it's clean again. So it's quite extraordinary. But that an event like that can actually completely uh, change in a macro invertebrate community. Uh, entirely, and you can actually look at it and then figure out what's happened in terms of what was in that what what was in that sediment cloud elementally, using these kind of uh, multivariate analysis systems. Next slide. Okay, pool riffle run for people who don't understand aquatic ecology very well. It all comes down to these aspects of a of a, of a stream. You've got the two images there. I'll look at the cross sectional one first. You can see pools kind of form um, as little as uh, rocky barriers appear in in rivers and everybody will have will have noticed that you can get pools in rivers where you have rock bars popping up so that's your pool sequence and then in the 2d plan view you can see that you've got the riffles popping up um, where where rock where rocky outcrops are coming from the geology and also possibly where sediment's been shifted or or even um, some geomorphology has occurred and then you've got a run where you've got water moving along uh, with uh, a, a no riffle and, and a moderate depth, and then you then form a pool. You can also see edge habitat, which will basically be near trees and riparian uh, vegetation. And that's basically how we form the concept of the three habitat types for a, a, an effective sampling site. Next slide, Richard. Okay, uh, now there's various risks with habitat uh, uh, types and I think these are important to bear in mind when you're about to begin a program because this will all be interrelated with upstream land use, upstream waste discharges, all sorts of types of things that we need to take into account when we're looking at the program because those things can affect the program more heavily than the industry or point source that we're actually trying to sample and it's very important to understand that at this stage. So pool habitats are very heavily impacted by sedimentation rates because the pool can fill up. Um, macro, small macroinvertebrates, which are often smaller than one millimetre, can be, actually be buried by high levels of sedimentation rates, which can kill some species off entirely. Um, and it, it appears that um, some of the macroinvertebrate types that are um, degraders and browsers in the bottom of, of pools actually can only handle certain sedimentation rates before they can't handle the level of change and they'll leave. This is very much impacted by upstream land use. So if you've got poor, poor practice agriculture or poor practice forestry, um, for instance, forestry roads with no stormwater controls, when it rains, all that sediment can end up in a pool. And I think the summary is uh, captured by usually most impacted from human activity, the pools, unfortunately. Edge habitat is a reasonably stable habitat. Um, if it's not damaged by poor riparian land uses. So um, in this situation, you could have, for instance, unrestricted stock access to a river. The stock with their hard hooves can walk uh, across down to the river, smash down the banks and kill all of the vegetation around the river, which immediately degrades the edge habitat quite strongly. You can also have weeds that can affect uh, edge habitat as well if the weeds overwhelm the edges. Um, edge, edge is a classic disturbance ecosystem, so weeds are very attracted to them. Um, and edge, edge habitat can also be affected by water depth. So if you've got long-term drought or long-term floods, uh, you can have very interesting impacts on edge habitat and macroinvertebrates communities. Riffle habitats is usually the most biodiverse habitat that we sample um, after edge. Um, riffle's often the most stable uh, because it's less impacted by land use. So riparian changes don't really impact riffles because they're in the middle of the river and vegetation removal from upstream and in the riparian zone doesn't tend to affect riffles too much either. Occasionally you can uh, remove a large tree and then a shaded riffle can become a sunny riffle and that water temperature change will, sh will change the community somewhat. But even, even with that sort of uh, impact, it will generally be a, a, a percentile change rather than a major change to the macroinvertebrate community found in that riffle. Um, but they are impacted by elevated sedimentation rates. So if the riffles, I mean, I always think of riffles as like multi-storey apartments. If you fill up the multi-storey apartments with rubble, there's not going to be many people living in them. And I guess the riffles just like that. Once the sedimentation rate goes up too high, uh, you've got a problem for the, for the riffle. Next slide, Richard. 
sediment sampling. So we do composite sampling across the uh, 100 meter stretch of the river, um, usually uh, 20 to 30 sites. Again, this is based on access, velocity, safety, etc. cetera. Um, we have to um, pre-process it for a laboratory in the field. So we generally put it through a one mil or two mil stainless steel sieve or something equivalent to try and separate out um, sand grains from what's being carried in the sediment. Uh, different depths of sampling are relevant to depending on what you want to pick up. So if you want to know what happened last year, you're probably sampling shallow. If you want to know what's happened 10 years ago, you're probably sampling a bit deeper. Uh, and it's quite important to try to determine your sedimentation rates in a river to figure out what those sampling depths are. And that's an art form all until itself. Um, definitely gives you lots of good data on seasonal deposition and metals precipitation. Um, water quality and sedimentation the sediment quality is always interrelated in a river, uh, but sometimes with the spot sampling of water quality, uh, the statistical relationship is not that great. And again, water quality can change quite a lot um, at any time. Uh, and the great thing is the, uh, the sediment is a bit like the bank balance. So if things are settling out of poor water quality um, events, that will generally be picked up in sediments, which is a very good reason to sample sediments at all times. Uh, and again, parameters, metals, major cations, anions, things like that. It depends what you're looking for. Definitely focus your program based on risk. So if you know there's a specific risk from your point source discharge or land use activity, you try to sample uh, the sediment for those kind of those kind of issues. Next slide, Richard. Water quality sampling, another key component of a multivariate program. Um, again, everybody's probably familiar with key, the key parameters we use for water, water quality sampling. Uh, field water quality is very important to take at the time of our um, sampling, and we're looking at typically temp, pH, ORP, EC, turbidity. Field alkalinity is very important for the Oz Rivers uh, protocol, as field alkalinity was discovered to be one of the major um, uh, pivot points for the statistical analysis. I think the sensitivity analysis of field alkalinity placed it in one of being the top, one of the top uh, water quality parameters actually that uh, really does change the macroinvertebrate community structure. So it's a very important thing to pick up. Um, not so important if you're not using the Oz Rivers scoring system. There's a bunch of indices you can use for macroinvertebrate community uh, assessment. Um, if you're not using Oz Rivers field alkalinity uh, which involves usually field titration of water and stuff, which is um, complex and you need to train people how to do it, uh, may not be required for all types of um, protocols. Lab, lab water quality is uh, very useful to get nutrients, major trace metals, um, specific point source toxicants if required. Uh, very important to, again, structure that based on what, what's likely to be in the discharges. Um, and it's, it's very important to select our indicators which are relevant to our potential impacts for a really good statistical effects analysis and then do them at every site in the program. One of the things about multivariate analysis is you really do have to have large amounts of data and you have to do everything at every site so you can do cross comparison. Next slide, Richard. Just before we move on, the, um, there's a few presentations at ECO Forum this year that ALGA runs and one of them, uh, was all about these emerging contaminants, right? Um, and I just wonder, like, when you're selecting which toxicants to actually analyse for, do you, how do you choose the organic stream, I suppose? Like, it seemed to me that this chap was saying um, that uh, we're really selecting them based on what it costs to analyse and you know, where we've got a methodology that's fairly straightforward to analyse. And he was really concerned that there's a whole wave of these emerging contaminants that, would, that are just not on our radar even in terms of that. So. Oh, look, Richard, all I can actually do is agree with that person. I mean, when I was at TAS EPA, um, ChemWatch database used to come on like five, three and a half inch floppy disks. Then it was one CD. Then it went up to about one DVD. And then I think it was about 19, no, no, I think it was about 2002, ChemWatch sent us six DVDs and they sent us a letter saying, hi, we're going to continue to look at about 50,000 chemicals, 50,000 new chemicals a year in the ChemWatch database. However, the human race is currently making 500,000 new chemicals every year and that's exponential. So 
I mean, I don't know the answer to it. I think the human race really has to control its chemical production. One of the things places like ChemWatch and um, the National Water Quality Management Strategy does is they have models for looking at uh, dangerous molecules, Richard. And you can take the molecular structure of something uh, which might be from an upstream activity, you can pump it into a model, and then it'll actually give you a pretty quick and dirty high risk, low risk, moderate risk from the structure of the molecule. I would really recommend people get into that sort of analysis before they start spending lots of money on very complicated testing, which is quite often, if it's not done properly, going to give you garbage results anyway. So I would always say, if you're going to test for something complicated, make sure you do it right, because there's nothing worse than getting the wrong answer when you're not doing it right uh, unknowingly. So yeah, definitely do it properly. And um, it's, it's an invidious issue. Uh, I think there are so many new chemicals now and there's no real way of actually being able to figure out what's going on apart from doing very decent upstream research. So I think when you're looking at a, managing a river, you really do have to, as a first step, analyze all of the upstream stakeholders and contributors to that river in terms of discharge and even just activity because dust being blown off a stockpile can sometimes be a major issue. I'm thinking of the Derwent in in, in Hobart, where you've got the EZ electrolytic zinc stockpiles with a whole bunch of heavy metals which blow into the derwent regularly as dust from their old stockpiles. So, and that dust is in the bottom of the derwent and it's going to be there for a long time because the derwent's now a controlled river. And where the EZ uh, factory is, is uh, in, a, in a part of the drowned river system. So it doesn't really get high flows anymore. It has tidal influence, but it's quite deep. So you've got issues like that, which people might not immediately associate with water quality monitoring. And you have to take into account all those issues when you're looking at upstream industry. So it's, it's an invidious, complicated issue, and it really requires a very high level of expertise and research to really figure out what the likely risks are. And then you need to carry those risks through to your program and make sure you've got appropriate parameters in it to pick those risks up. So it's very complicated. And I really don't know the answer because there's a whole bunch of stuff we can't even test for, Richard. So not even sure how we deal with that. All right, I might have derailed the presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It, it was a good derailment. I think we need to realise that, yeah, that that the uh, the modern modern technology is really a big thing, and and we can't even monitor for everything. It's it's a it's an issue that I think our young people in particular really need to have deep thinks about. Okay, part two: data testing and multivariate analysis. This is really the engine room of of a multivariate program, of course. Next slide, Richard. Sorry. No, you're right. Uh, so it all comes down to statistical testing of your data. So you've been out in the field for two weeks, you've collected 10 sites, you've got all of the above for everything. You've got, you know, um, you've got say 12 macro and ver macro and phyla, you've got probably five to 20 sub family species. So you've got these giant spreadsheets of data. You've got all this water quality, lab water quality. You've probably got 60, parameters in water quality, you've got 60 parameters in soil sediment, you've got all your field parameters, and you've got at least probably five to six parameters of field parameters, field water quality parameters at each site. You've got all of your riparian vegetation community assessment. You've got all this packs and packs of data, and you basically then have to split it up turn it into a big table of summary data and then start doing some statistical testing on it to make sure you've got sufficient variation in that data to justify that it's actually going to stand up statistically to testing. And these statistical tests are essential and you've really got to look at things like um, minimizing your possibility for the null hypothesis We've got to look at relative predictive power of all of the ecological indices that we're using for the um, description of all of the different ecological communities that we're testing, and that's macroinvertebrates, riparian vegetation, and sometimes aquatic plant vegetation. Um, some people also use um, macro macrophytes. Some people use attached growth. There's a whole bunch of crazy ecology which you will need to uh, drag into this uh, test to make sure that you're actually getting valid data. Um, and there's quite a few relationships between 
the ecological indices you're using, water quality, land use and habitat. So again, you've got to think very carefully about all of those relationships when you're looking at these tests. Next slide, Richard. Um, so to do this uh, data variation testing, we're using um, F and P tests. Um, the F test is probably the classic critical test for the confirmation of rejection of the null hypothesis. And if you've got a good test, you should have a really good F test, which means you're going to have valid variation for the calculated degrees of Bear with us, guys. So if we can get David back, seems to have dropped out. Uh, large numbers of sites, but fewer numbers of parameters. You can also have difficulties with making sure you've got the appropriate levels of variation. So high, high relative values for the F tests uh, usually shows that the data is good uh, for multivariate statistical analysis. And the P value is just giving you a probability estimate that the calculated F value is going to be lower. And if you've got a very low P value, and in this table below, you can see we've got a p-value of 2.8 to 10 to, by 10 to the minus 9, which is a pretty low probability uh, that, it's, that it's wrong. So in that one, we're looking happy. And we've got appropriate degrees of freedom within groups and between groups. And the uh, F-test is higher than the F-critical, which is great to see. So this whatever, whatever data we've applied that to, that's good data. And we can be happy knowing that it's statistically valid for our testing for multivariate analysis next slide david you did drop out um for oh sorry minutes there what um, did you miss out on probably the first part so maybe if you just introduce the f and p test again oh okay so the f test is critical for confirmation of the rejection of the null hypothesis within your data set uh, and if you get the appropriate f test you're going to have a, a valid variation level for your calculated degrees of freedom and that means that issues such as having too few sites and too many variables and too many sites and too few variables can be picked up within this testing. And to some extent, this has to be dealt with by an experienced pr practitioner when they're setting up the program in the original setting up of the program. But you still have to test it when you've done the program because you can get crazy situations where you have seasonal drought and suddenly you don't have a great F test and you have to then adapt your program to deal with that. Sometimes you have to drop data in order to make the multivariate assessment work because you don't have significant very and a significant enough variation in the data to actually do multivariate testing on it and get an actual result. A high relative value for the F test um, in the data is generally showing you that you've got a good result and that you can do lots of multivariate and statistical analysis effectively on the data set and that will be accurate. The p-value gives you the probability estimate of the calculated f-value being lower than what's estimated and low p-values provide the good confidence in an f-test. So in the table below you can see the p-value there is 2.9 by 10 to the minus 49 so that's a very low probability. The f-test is higher than the f-critical which basically means that this data set we've tested here checks out as being good quality and we're going to get great levels of analysis for the degrees of freedom. You've got degrees of freedom between the groups of 17 and within groups 214. So that's generally a pretty good sign of a good program. Next slide. Okay, choosing appropriate um, indices is super important for our ecology analysis. Um, and you can apply them to all of our life, riparian life, fish life, macroinvertebrate life. Uh, there's many, many indices around. There's diversity, abundance, richness, ASPT, which is good for sewage and landfill. BMW tyre we use in Asia quite a lot. That's great for nutrient impacts and also picks up uh, sewage impacts very well. And then, of course, we've got our Oz Rivers systems, which are good for toxicants, good for all-round impacts, but they're only really set up for Australia and Indonesia. Um, and you can adapt them for other environments, which is what we tend to do at Earth Systems. Um, we can test these indices by looking at um, linear regression models. And you can see here, we've got one model down the bottom there, which is richness versus signal. That's got an R squared of about 
0.42, which is good. Whereas other things such as abundance versus richness, richness versus filer, and abundance versus ASPT, for this data, those indices weren't as good. So we're suddenly thinking richness and signal is probably not a bad method of analysis for this particular data set. Next slide, Richard. And another great test is um, similarity testing to look at the suitability of various parameters for assessment as well. So we apply them to all of our multivariate parameters. This is very complicated, this, set, this, uh, this method, and sometimes requires large amounts of processing power to do, depending on how big your data set is. But in the one to the right, you can see a stripped down system where we've got quite a few indices. Uh, richness, filer, etc., set up with field water quality, so temperature, pH, ORP, DO, and AC. And you can see from that um, that data set that we've got um, our pool, riffle, and edge indices coming up as being extremely interrelated with the water quality indicators, which is exactly what you do want to see. Whereas BMW, PTI, ASPT, True Diversity, Shannon, and Simpson, they're off to one side. So they are similar, but they're only uh, at a at a similarity of about 0.1, whereas our um, edge pool and riffle indices are at a similarity of about 0.8, which is extremely similar. And that's that means you've got a, a great data set in those indices. So you'll tend to use the pool riffle indices that you've got to do the analysis on the major system effects. Lots of tests for similarity are available, like Bray Curtis, which we we'll use here on the right. Next slide. Okay, spatial mapping is extremely important because we've got upstream downstream land uses. We've often got multiple backies in a, in, a, in a situation. You might have upstream and downstream at multiple sites like we do in this picture, and you might have a reference site as well, which we do in this picture. So it's incredibly important to see what's going on. You can quite often see increases and decreases in water quality as you go down the river system, which you've got here. As you can see, in the middle of this river system, you've got a score of about 5.09. Then it declines because of particular uh, human impacts in the creek, including quarrying and sand mining. Drops down a bit further as a result of some downstream artisanal mining and then pops back up later on to 5.1 because the river's had long enough to recover and the tributary to the north has delivered some good quality water with a score of five. So you can see that it's really essential to look at spatial mapping. <coughs> and um, I really can't... Um, recommend that enough, especially where you've got complex land uses. So in, in Southeast Asia, as you probably are aware, any catchment you can point a stick at will have so many different activities going on. There'll be upstream grazing, agriculture, forestry, heavy industry, all sorts of stuff. And you need to really look at these scores carefully because at each point in the river, you might have a particular upstream impact, which is causing that result. Next slide, Richard. I <laughs> really should have got that glass of water. <laughs> um, detailed impacts and effects analysis. Now, this is one of the really strongest tools that comes out of the multivariate uh, uh, macroinvertebrate style and, and ecology style analysis of a river. Um, you can see on the right-hand side there, we've got a way of prov providing the indices there. We've got filer mapped against indices scores. And when we use that... Uh, 2D framework, we can actually break impacts down into these, what we call the quadrant system. Um, you can see where we've got near natural conditions, where you've got high levels of filer and high levels of indice scores, you're looking at a near natural system, which is a relief. You sort of think, okay, this, this river's within some sort of natural tolerable range. But then once you start having filer dropping off or um, indice scores dropping off, you're jump, jumping into things such as specific toxic and impacts, where you've got low levels of filer. <laughs> But, but high scores. So you've got specific toxicants only impacting specific species, which is a really interesting signal to come out of the whole system. Uh, or you can have low low scores and low filer, which means you've probably got all round impacted water quality or even riparian zone massive land use impacts, which is something else that needs to be managed differently where rather than worrying about water quality, you're really having to go back to step one and say to people, okay, you need to fix your riparian zone habitat because there's so few trees left there that the, uh, the, the ecology is suffering, fish numbers are dropping, bug numbers are dropping. And then of course you can have the uh, fourth uh, possible outcome, which is high filer, low scores. And that's a classic situation you get from salinity and habitat Im impact. So if someone has uh, really, um, messed up the edge habitat by having stock access, for instance, that, that can very, very frequently push a stream section into that zone 
the grey zone, as we call it, where you've just got scores that are much lower than they should be, but you've still got a lot of bugs hanging on in that in that habitat type. Next slide, Richard. Okay, now uh, one of the penultimate things that you can do with this kind of detailed multivariate analysis is actually work out things like upstream land use relative contribution to index scoring. And you can see here we've prepared a pie chart which gives you the relative impacts of each of the upstream impacts. So you've got things like, you know, being able to put an actual percentage on the amount of impact being caused by things like industry, you know, townships and their landfills, agricultural impacts, things like sand mining in this in this particular river. Uh, was found to be one of the biggest issues for their local area we were monitoring in. So it's incredibly useful because when you're giving this data to a government, they can then say, okay, this is how we're going to have to split up our budget. This is how we're going to have to apply the effort. Uh, this is where we're going to be pushing pushing the, uh, the wheelbarrow. For instance, rather than immediately going to see industry and saying, hey, we need a million bucks to fix this problem, uh, they're probably going to be saying, hey, wow, township and agriculture are big, big, big stakeholders in this problem. <coughs> so they need to be at the, the bargaining table as well. So it gives you the ability to do some really interesting follow up uh, recommendations for clients and for government departments. <coughs> Sorry about that. Just coughing a bit. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very powerful technique. And I, I can't think of any other way that you can really back this kind of information up statistically without using multivariate river health assessments. Uh, anyway, next slide, Richard. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to grab a glass of water? No, I think I'm okay. I think I'll make it through the end, Richard. <laughs> okay. I could have a bit of a break in a minute. All right. So maybe I'll do the key take-homes while you grab a glass of water if you like. Okay, shall do. Thank you, Richard. Um, so what have we learned from David today? Well, it's certainly learned a lot. Um, in terms of program design and data sampling, well, clearly it's very important to get that bit right. Uh, this concept of before, after control and impacted site selection is essential for statistical analysis of impact. Secondly, the statistical program design is essential to remove various external bias from the data. So obviously a lot of um, potential for that to occur, like David's mentioned things like dust blown in from stockpiles and that sort of thing. For visual aquatic habitat assessment, the Oz Rivers visual assessment protocols provide a good approach. And it sounds like eWater can provide training in that methodology. So if you're interested in that, I'd suggest reaching out to them. Multi-parameters need to be sampled in the field simultaneously. So you need to have a broad range of people of different skills to get this right. It was something that I really picked up in this. So sediments, water quality, macro invertebrates, fish, as well as the riparian vegetation side of things. So a lot of different skills required to do it right. Um, in terms of data testing and multivariate analysis, it's always a thing that's underdone in this, um, you know, in a lot of studies, which is just having enough data to statistically assess your data set for variability and QAQC. So really important because that really does underpin everything that you then conclude. It's important to check ecological indices for their applicability and accuracy. It'd be very easy to use the wrong one. And as David said, there's lots and lots of them. There are some very useful statistical analysis procedures such as linear regression and similarity testing. So finally, when the program is built and analyzed, it's a very powerful tool for detecting effects and impacts in aquatic ecosystems. That is, it allows us to determine what action causes what impact. And I thought that was really powerful, that pie chart that showed the various industries and their percentage impact, because it'd be very easy to spend money in the wrong spot for rectifying sites. So I thought that was really powerful. Now, we better move straight to the questions. So in terms of our early bird questions, we've got four. 
first one, has this work been or is it being developed as a method for regional water accounts under the Accounting for Nature framework? David? Yeah, so uh, we, we thought it's pro probably not. I don't know for sure, but I would certainly recommend that it is being used for regional water accounts under the Accounting for Nature framework. We very probably collect enough data to use these kind of approaches to do this work, but I can't be sure that it's going on. Okay. Question number two, I think we might have covered this in the presentation. What statistical methods can distinguish upstream, downstream differences in water quality? Yeah, so really, I think the importance of a good backy design is really the, the answer to that question. If you've got a good control site, you can really um, measure the differences in upstream and downstream uh, seasonally, through time, and also individually, which is quite important because the upstream impact should be uh, close to what the, the control site is. If something changes in the upstream site, that can be quite often very responsible for the downstream changes as well. And that's, that's the key point is to have a control site which is in a completely separate river, uh, not impacted by any of the same land uses or other issues, point source discharges, et cetera, in your monitoring program. And again, that's what that's that that really is the rub, and it's also the tough thing to get right because uh, control sites can be impacted themselves. So selecting a good control site that has little human uh, potential impact is essential and difficult. So, where can this go wrong? I suppose what are the pitfalls in this method? Yeah, look, I'd say uh, the pitfalls are really, Richard, that it is very complicated. There's there's a lot of different um, uh, people involved. There's a lot of specialist inputs. So I think the pitfalls are not employing experienced people to do the work. You really need uh, people who are top of their game in all these areas. You need to have very good communication. I think if you've got people off in their ivory towers and they're all siloed into different functions within the project, you're going to possibly have pitfalls because people aren't talking to each other about what each different team needs. So communication is extraordinarily important. Getting the right experts is extraordinarily important. And then following good procedures in the field. So having established protocols, well-trained people, knowing the limitations of your people and knowing the limitations of your laboratories is also incredibly important. So working very closely with your home laboratories. So finding out the limitations of your lab, finding out things like, you know, detection limits and stuff are all essential and then feed back up into the major the major program and they're pitfalls if you don't undertake those 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 uh those or if you don't have an answer to those issues that they're, they're major pitfalls that can occur other things that can happen uh for instance i was talking about before you can set up a spectacular program one year and then next year you can come back and there's been an, an avalanche a landslide through one of your key sites and it's no longer a key site that can create a huge issue if you're using a control site uh, for interannual variability. So, yeah, there, there are potential pitfalls. Uh, the, I mean, the, the answer is you can't control everything, but having a backup plan is always good. So having two reference sites is sometimes a great idea, and we try to do that um, as much as we can. Having two or three reference sites is very, very useful. But, again, getting harder and harder to be, to be possible in this day and age. Okay. But the last one of the early bird, how much data do you need to make this work? Well, the answer to that is as much as you can get. Uh, the more data you have, the better the method works. Um, but again, uh, it needs to be selected within a budget. So you can't have an infinite amount of data. And again, it comes down to choosing what the, uh, the uh, monitoring program needs to pick out of the system. So again, um, I think one of the key pieces of data you need is what are the upstream land uses and potential point source discharges and other impacts that the, that the uh, anthropocentric parts of the uh, aquatic habitat are being exposed to. If you've got that data, then you can flow that data down into the construction of the entire program, including the parameters. But the short answer is as much data as possible. And, um, and I think to, to get it to work properly, um, you can 
pare down the system. You can, for instance, not do sediment if you want to. You can potentially not do lab water quality, but some of the data is um, non-negotiable. Field water quality, field alkalinity, and macroinvertebrates. If you want to do a really good multivariate analysis, you really, really need them. And without having lab water quality, you are missing a major possible uh, source of data that can give some absolutely illuminating and targeted answers for your client or your government department that you might be doing this work for. So I think, yeah, the short answer is as much as you can get. Um, and the long answer is, but you can strip it down a little bit. Thank you. Now we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A, so you've sparked some interest. Well done. I'm going to read those out if you could answer those. First question is from Andrew Thexton. Sampling methods such as netting may affect water quality. How is this taken into account? Um, we do all of the water quality sampling before we get into the river to make a mess. That's probably the first way we take into account. Um, secondly, if we're talking about localised impacts on species, because the sampling's uh, being undertaken so quickly when the disturbance is occurring, all of the bugs and all of the fish are still there. Um, we tend to, after we've done the water quality and sediment sampling, um, we, we then collect the macroinvertebrates. Sometimes we collect macroinvertebrates, fish and sediment simultaneously, just by moving to different sections of the river and using the river to flush itself as it needs to. And for instance, for fish, quite often we'll actually put a major seine net across the bottom of the, the run that we're, we're testing and the uh, field fish ecologists will walk up the up the reach uh, looking for the fish and then they'll go and check the lower net to make sure that they've got all of the fish they're looking for so there's a variety of techniques to prov to, to make sure that you're not actually um, dirtying your sample in inverted commas and um, and that's basically the way we do it so you do your water quality first anything that's highly sensitive you do first um, and then you work through into the less sensitive parts of the uh, methodology as you go down the, the hierarchy of sensitivity. Okay, good. Uh, Dan Evans, another problem with using eDNA might be a lack of DNA library data for species that David is focused on in other countries. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Um, because we're working at family level, um, it's probably not as bad as 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 what we would think um, if we're working at species level i think we'd be in big trouble but family level um, is probably not too bad because there's i think there's pretty strong genetic similarities at family level but look one thing that i think would be very difficult is is again just moving that biological sample around the place because i think the number of institutions that can do really decent dna sampling from um from aquatic macroinvertebrates, it's a, it's a pretty short list of people. Um, and there's there's no real established methodology for doing it that I've seen yet, Richard, either. Um, uh, like I've seen methods varying from like throwing all of the samples into a blender and then sending it off for, um, uh, you know, RNA analysis. And I've also seen where they preferentially sample the macroinvertebrates and then put them into a blender and then do the same thing. So I, I don't know. I think before it's a useful technique, we need to have a protocol. We need to have somebody to sit down, look at the statistics of the situation, model it, uh, make some decisions about the statistical significance of the DNA sampling methodology itself, then finalize a methodology and then we do it. But at the moment, it's more of a, I don't know, a academic interest style thing. Um, I think in the future, it will probably be, be becoming something where it's very quick. Like you can imagine, you know, in a bright future, you have some sort of field DNA test that you can just, you know, vitamize your bugs into, throw it into this thing and a whole bunch of bars come up saying, here's your species list. That would be fabulous. But I think that's a few years away yet. We did have a webinar on this, um, must be 12 months ago. They did have some methodologies and they did have a very comprehensive library of... Uh, the DNA that they referred to. So I don't know, I might hunt that out for you. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good one to look at. We do look at it from time to time, but yeah, it's a very specialist area. Um, and again, yeah, we do, I think we just have problems importing material from other countries to the, the, com, the complex labs that can do the work. So 
and I, I think the the person who asked the question is probably correct too. There's probably some issues in uh, transferring species between um, continents. Like uh, I'm not sure the DNA will be exactly the same. So that that would be something we should definitely look for in that presentation. It might be an Australia based thing. All right, we'll move on from that slightly contentious topic. Um, <laughs> Next one's from an anonymous attendee. How would you quantify whether harm is trivial or non-trivial from the water quality perspectives that you assess? Um, well, luckily that just comes naturally out of the program. The program is uh, extremely subtle and has multiple levels of um, ability to detect change. And I think um, in the indices scores, there's quite a lot of academic research, which has been done over the last 30 to 40 years, where you can relate a particular indice score to being uh, low risk, moderate risk or high risk, and probably even uh, shades of grey in between that. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the system is actually extremely easy to use to judge those impacts. Whether or not humans want to do anything about those impacts, that's a completely different thing. You can say to a government department, wow, you've got this problem, and then literally nothing will be done about it. So one of the issues for me is not really the science, it's actually the next step, which is taking the science to the stakeholders and then making sure that the budget gets cut up correctly from all of the various people who own risks and are causing risk and then it gets actioned. And to be honest, that definitely is the Pareto effect. I think the monitoring of this stuff is 10% of the work. 90% of the work is the follow-up recommendations that come from the science where people are fixing stuff. <coughs> I just ran out of water. Sorry about that. <laughs> you might be the first presenter we've killed. We'll yeah, well, I, only had, I only had COVID three weeks ago, Richard, so I'm still coming back. <laughs> Probably should have your mask on, David. Um, next question's from Jean Meeklem. G'day, Jean. For unknown chemicals, try looking at Archie, A-R-C-H-I-E database, um, DCC, DCC double -E -W. That's desktop assessment looking at chemicals by structure similarity and other factors oh excellent yeah that's 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 more of a, a note rather than a question isn't it yeah 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 i think that's that's a really good bit of input i didn't write down obviously i didn't prepare for that that answer um so i think that's if people are interested in that specific issue that's a great a great um, model there are other models which also do it and i'm very sorry but they've all slipped out of my mind i could probably google quickly but i think we'll just leave it to everybody else to google and that that comment i think can give a good start google okay how high is high for an f value ah like uh, uh like a an, well in in oz rivers um the the system is a well x which is um super abundant which quite often occurs below a sewage outfall and then we have a b c d so d to get a d with oz rivers you really are looking at a situation where you've got something like um 50 percent of all the macroinvertebrate species impacted missing with presence absence data recorded um, to get that kind of level of 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 problem you'd have to have either some massive uh, land use upstream, which is really impacting sedimentation and water quality levels, such as, um, you know, poor practice agriculture, poor practice forestry, poor practice road design, um, things like that. So it would be something that's highly impacted. You'd also have to have multiple missing parts of the riparian zone. The bugs quite often have a life cycle, which includes uh, macrophytes in the stream edge include some of the trees. They lay their eggs all over these places. And then sometimes the eggs hatch, fall into the water. Sometimes the eggs hatch into a larval phase, which then falls into the water. So move, removing the riparian habitat and riparian vegetation <coughs> is often the key to causing big problems for a, a stream. And there's plenty of streams that I've monitored 
where the water quality is actually quite good. Like it's possibly at a 95th percentile, 99th percentile level of toxicants based on the Oz Rivers, sorry, sorry, the National Water Quality Management Strategy, ANZEC guidelines. But then for some reason, the macroinvertebrates are missing. And when you look carefully at the surrounding land uses, it's because the surrounding land uses are very poor. But yeah, to get it to get a D, you really do have to have a bunch of stuff missing from the ecology. All right. Next question, another anonymous attendee. Do you have any general go-to transformations for biotic and abiotic data sets prior to assessing similarity and dissimilarity? Yeah, look, there's quite a few transformations. I think I I tend to follow the protocols for various indices. And I think throughout the talk, you saw me uh, throwing back a few times to things like BMWP tie, um, ASPT. We've used the Oz Rivers stuff. We've used Signal. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, standard ecological indices which we'd use for transforming data. Um, we have used things like um, twin span style analysis, which is a statistical ecological function for looking at um, community similarity and variance. Um, you've got things like uh, similarity analysis with Bray Curtis. There's a swathe of other similarity and difference style um, functions, which you can look and apply to your data. Um, and then I think you can actually uh, select parts of your data after you've done that kind of analysis and create sub data sets, which you can then do even more detailed variation assessments on to get much more focused results. And when you've got huge data sets, that's a very, very important process. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing things. I tend to use um, data transformation based on the data itself. So it's very difficult to say, look, here's a you know, here's one way of doing it because um, as you investigate the data, you find out something different in nearly every data set. You can even be looking at the same river from like 2022 and 2023, and you'll see different indices, different um, different trends in the data actually result in different um, different systems being useful for really picking up the precise, fine-tuned aspects of the analysis. Like if you've got scoring shifts where you've got scores of, of great difference. That's always the thing that you want to pull into the program. Variation is really important. If you've got a scoring system which is giving you zero variation, there's not a lot that you can say about it um, in any real relative terms. So it's really about sorting through your data, checking it for QAQC, looking for variation, looking for the issues and the indices which have the most variation in them, and then really nutting down on those and figuring out why. Thanks for that. Um, are you happy to keep going for about another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, for sure. Assuming my throat doesn't yep. give it. Subject, subject to that. Yeah. Um, if you see me fall over, Richard, just end the thing quickly, please. <laughs> <laughs> a little eulogy for you. All yep. right. Uh, next question is from David Bassetto. Is it possible to get the copy of the PowerPoint presentation and the video recording? Yes, if you log into our website on Monday afternoon, we will have the recording up there. There's all the recordings of all the webinars. It's under the webinar heading, and um, they're all there with the video. So um, feel free to grab that. Um, next question from Rain Reddy. Has, or Rainy, maybe. Has this been done for the Murray-Darling River? where it is really needed across states? That's a good question. It, that is a good question. And the answer is, uh, I'm going to give it pretty much a yes. Uh, not not exactly the same system that we've used at Earth Systems, because our system is very complicated and um, uh, includes probably one of the largest collections of simultaneous data that I can think of. There's a lot of programs like the Derwent Estuary program springs to mind where, yeah, they collect sediment, but they collect it at a different time to when they collect macroinvertebrates. They collect water quality, but they collect it at a different time to when they collect sediment. So I think uh, it's the simultaneous collection of data that we do at Earth Systems, which uh, provides a really great snapshot of what's really going on. 
Um, when we apply that to the client's data and the government data, which is long term and probably regular, like monthly or uh, similar time steps to that, you can really slot the, the, the data that you've got on the day into that data and it gives it a great context. Um, and a great level of analysis that's not possible in any other way. And the Murray-Darling does have Ausrivers programs done on it, and it is part of the National River Health Pro Hopefully David clicks back in in a moment. Again, Richard. <laughs> Sorry, you cut out there for a minute. Yeah. Anyway, so Vic Victoria has its own Oz Rivers protocol. So Victoria used to have its own kind of like Victorian uh, river health assessment based on bugs and uh, macroinvertebrate assessment as well. So you can look, you can Google for those kind of things to see this kind of work being done um, in Australia. But again, I don't think you're going to see programs where they've taken into account as many issues as what we do. The stuff we do at Earth Systems is quite often based in the mining sector. So the discharges we have in the mining sector are highly technical and highly complex. Whereas a lot of the work that's being done in the Murray-Darling Basin is aimed towards agricultural and other uh, land use style mm -hmm. impact, which mm -hmm. are different, different types mm -hmm. of uh, impacts which can be picked up different ways. So you, you, would, you would probably not need the type of complexity that we have uh, in our systems. I, I'm not sure, for instance, that they take fish tissue analysis into account in the Murray-Darling work. Um, and I'm not sure how complicated they undertake sediment sampling in that program either. I think they really are just looking at a riparian zone habitat and, um, and bug scores for that sort of national river health stuff. Hopefully that answers that. And I could be wrong. So if anybody knows more about that, <laughs> feel free to chime in. You better not be wrong. That's a fine <laughs> answer, David. Um, next question from Rainy Reddy. Have you observed any clear impact of climate change in the river ecosystems you have worked on? Yeah, I, I won't say climate change, but I will say climate variability. As, as I said before, we've got clear signals of drought. We've got clear signals of flash flooding, We've got horrendous levels of flooding that actually modifies stream beds and takes out entire sites that have been man, uh, monitored successfully in previous years. And there's literally missing pool habitat it's, and things like that. You've got vast ecosystem change. Yeah, I think we have climate variability impacts. Um, that's why we need control sites because the, the, the issue is the world is a dynamic place. You can have a one in a thousand level you know, rainfall storm up catchment of your target river there's no doubt the river will be a different river after that one in a thousand year rainfall than what or what it was before and hopefully your control river uh, is not as impacted by that rainfall event or even better you have three control sites one is impacted by the rainfall but the other two aren't and then you can actually con compare within your controls to see what the impact of that one in a thousand year storm was and then apply that to your upstream downstream um, and impacted site analysis data to figure out what's really going on so yeah i think the short answer is no i haven't done any climate related specific stuff but we definitely have got clear evidence of the fact that climate variability impacts on these work and if climate variability impacts on the work then there's no doubt that climate change will shift results through time gradually and we need to start looking at that as we move into these SSP 8.5 times that we're living in. Do you ever do that? Do you ever do projections based on the long-term climate change modelling that's been done? I, I do, Richard. For many clients, I actually derive statistically downscaled uh, future climate data from anywhere between 2050 to 2200. Very complicated stuff. Um, and we've just moved from CMIP 5 to CMIP 6. So instead of having 40 uh, general circulation models to do this work on, we now have about 170. <laughs> and we don't just have, I think we don't have three or four scenarios anymore. Now we've got about six or seven 
climate scenarios. It starts at about SSP 1.1 or something rather and goes up to 8.5. In the old system, CMIP, CMIP 5, there was only a few, a few fewer ones. I think it was um, RCP 2 up to RCP 8.5. One thing I'd like to actually ask the group rhetorically is should we have SSP 10? Because do we have evidence that we're even going to achieve 8.5? You know, and 8.5 is our current trajectory. So, you know, it's not very optimistic, but maybe we need an SSP 10 to come out of the IPCC modeling. They're going to have trouble answering that unless they write in, but um, yep. let's move on. <laughs> um, if there's anyone from the IPCC on the call, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, next question from Dan Evans. Can David please elaborate? a bit on the relative contribution to aquatic ecology effects approach, guessing some form of mixing model, cumulative impact analysis would be required because localised observed riverine site impacts might not necessarily be due to localised land use or contaminant sources. Golly, that's a complicated question to pull apart. Um, I think, again, the short answer is you really need to take into account every single piece of data that you can collect at a particular site. So you need to look at immediate land uses in the riparian zone. Um, you need to even look at change, such as shading of river systems and things like that. Then you need to look beyond the river banks into what's happening immediately outside there. So farming, agriculture, industry, whatever's going on. Um, and then, yeah, if you if you do if you are aware of the fact that industry is using a mixing zone at a site, um, I probably would avoid the mixing zone. Um, we know the mixing zone is going to be an area of reduced environmental values. What we really want to know is is that mixing zone sustainable, and what size is the mixing zone? So I would probably recommend doing this kind of work. Uh, at the edge, you, usually mixing zones have an agreed size, and let's let's put a site at the bottom edge. Let's put a site at the top edge, and then let's let's try and actually figure out is that mixing zone causing an impact. But I don't think I'd use this sort of work to detect impacts in a mixing zone per se. You can easily do that, but I think once you're in a mixing zone, you have continual. Um, toxicants arriving in the ecosystem. And I think probably the better way and the more, um, uh, I guess, uh, simple way to look at these impacts would be just to use the ANZAC 2000 and, uh, and, and uh, ongoing guidelines because we've got specific toxicant levels, we've got specific levels of protection within the, the mixing zone, and you can easily make a decision about what what levels of protection you're going to have in your mixing zone. You could do a, an Oz Rivers program to validate those levels. So like if, if you're saying, hey, outside my mixing zone, there's a 99% level of protection, you could easily go downstream, do Oz Rivers, and then figure out if you've got 99% uh, protection and things like that. Um, and you could also do the Oz Rivers program within the mixing zone. And, and if there was a level of protection within the mixing zone, like say they were using 80th percentile or something in there, you could probably use it for that. But I know some mixing zones are set up so they're actually very much below the ANZAC guidelines. Like you might have a 50th level uh, of, of, of protection just extrapolating down in terms of guideline levels or extrapolating up, depending on which way you're thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I, it's it, you could do it, um, but I, I it, it would be different strokes for different folks. If I'm in a mixing zone, I'm going to be looking a lot more at, at toxicants because the toxicant framework in the um, ANZAC guidelines is very well established and, and very complex and useful in its own right. Thanks for that. A couple more questions. Margaret Peel, why does sand mining have such a major impact on river health? That's a great question, Margaret. And the answer is basically sediment. Um, when sediment is released into a river, um, the river stops being clear and um, sunlight uh, in, in, in ecology where sunlight can get to the bottom of the river, you've nearly always got happier bugs. I think it's the, 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 the analogy I've got is it's why do people move to Queensland when they retire? And I guess it's because it's warmer and sunnier up there than it is in Melbourne. Uh, similar thing in, in rivers, bugs really like it when they've got sun, they've got appropriate conditions. Um, if we're using the analogy of the multi-storey apartment again, 
uh, in a river that's clear, the multi-story apartment, all of the rooms in the multi-story apartment are nice and big and lots of bugs can live in those rooms. Once you start having sediment arrive from things like a sand mine, the rooms in the apartment fill up with um, sediment and you've got less room for the bugs. You've also got less diversity in the bugs because um, most bugs have gills, just like fish and sediment loading and turbidity levels on gills are only survivable to, to a certain point. So a very uh, sensitive species like dragonfly, dragonfly larvae, mayfly nymphs, things like that, their gills are going to be impacted by sediment very quickly indeed. And, and they will be not in that ecosystem. They'll be gone from sediment pollution. So um, sediments and sand mining are interrelated. And unless the river has natural levels of sediment in it already, uh, higher levels of sediment are going to cause immediate change. I think there's been a couple of papers written in Australia about uh, things like major stock crossings in major river systems where they've done Oz rivers upstream downstream of major stock crossings and they've discovered that a major stock crossing will actually influence the seasonal Oz rivers scores. So yeah sediment is a really big player and therefore uh, appropriate land use and good quality or not good quality uh, uh, good practice land uses are essential to maintain the health of our streams by one of the main things is removing sediment and that's why there's been a lot of work done in the last 20 years on stormwater design and stormwater quality because stormwater carries a lot of sediment which impacts on our uh, ecosystems in a very big way um, probably more so than uh, point source discharges because there's far fewer point source discharges than there are stormwater discharges in most rivers very good Okay, last four questions. I think we'll call it a day after that. Um, Will Macbeth in classic Backy, B-A-C-I, B-A -C -I, B -A refers to before, after. In the temporal context, but your B-A, David, refers to levels of the spatial comparison additional to impact and control. Broadly, how would you then monitor through time? Maybe Dookie, D-U-C-I, would be a more accurate name for your spatial design. Yeah, it, it, could, it could well be. That's true. Um, I always think of back, uh, uh, Backy and M Backy as being in that particular annual sequence, either in spring or autumn. Um, and I think we, an we analyse stuff inter interseasonally and interannually through time because that's incredibly important to see if there's drift in our control data particularly and also to see if we need to apply any sort of drift from controlled data into the actual effects data um, having said that i think yeah all i can do is probably agree with that assessment that our uh, the levels of analysis that we've got in some of our sites where we have multiple years of analysis is definitely uh, a, a different level of temporal analysis but having said that I've done many jobs like this where we're just in that river once. And so there is no real temporal aspect to it. We're just giving a government department or a natural resource management agency or, a, or an industrial client a single data point, which then they're taking into their management systems. So yeah, some, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Thank you. Uh, Jean Meekland has sent through a link to the Australian regulatory chem informatics engine so, oh fantastic another great link yeah thank you um i will circulate that through to you david um paul webb murray darling basin has done what they call a sustainable rivers audit which has included oz rivers bugs sampling has been intermittent and is currently being redeveloped to also include non-biophysical indicators. So there you go, David. They're following in your fine footsteps there by the sounds of it. Um, yeah, I think one of the things they're doing, Richard, is they're trying to bring in more human activities, I think, so land use style um, things into their assessment system, which I think is great. We need, we need to do that, definitely, in Australia. There's so many people using the river for so many different things. Yeah. Last one's an anonymous one. 
How do you account for lab holding times when working remotely in Tanzania? <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, the short answer is, well, you, you can't really. Um, uh, quite often we will be in a situation where the lab, the preferred lab holding times are exceeded. Um, the ice has melted in the esky. The samples have probably got up to the same ambient temperature as the air temperature. But, you know, when I talk to lab managers about what this really means, 99% um, of the time they're not too worried because the tests we're trying to do are not specifically impacted by that change in holding time. So, again, it gets back to my comments about talking to your lab. If you know the program you're going to do, you need to talk to the lab and say, okay, I'm going to exceed the holding times of this, 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 and this. What do I need to do? Should I monitor for that uh, parameter? That lab manager will then give you an extremely detailed response about uh, the potential impacts on your data, uh, the potential impacts on the reliability and quality of the result that they're going to give you. And you then need to make a decision about whether you include or not include that parameter in your um, your sampling program. And because sampling programs are expensive, if there's any doubt at all where the, there's a mismatch between what you're trying to uh, find impacts from and the procedure to do it, you you really are better off dropping that test because if it's not if it's not value for money if you can't demonstrate QAQC you're better off not doing the test so I think working really closely with your lab manager on it, literally every parameter for water quality and sediment and fish tissue is essential but we've found over the years that because of the things we've been looking at uh, we are really able to adjust our programs based on withholding periods sample preservation times and all those kind of things to make sure we still get great results. One of the things, for instance, we don't do because it's just too much for us is um, acidifying samples in the field. Um, we just we just don't do that. It's too dangerous. We've got so many things on our mind. We don't want to splash HCL on our on ourselves in the field. So we just get you know pre-dosed lab bottles. Um, you know we just we change our approach to try and make everything as easy as possible by, by working really closely with our lab guys and it's astounding when you start working closely with really experienced lab people they generally have a solution to pretty much every problem you throw at them so yeah just communicate tell them what the problems are and they'll generally have answers the second part of that question was I am interested in local macro specialists and keen to find out if you align with the university there. So that's in Taz, Tanzania. Um, oh, wow, Tanzania. I'll have to take that on notice, Richard. We are we do have a guy in Tanzania, but I can't remember who it is because it's been about five years since I've been to Tanzania. So, yep, I'll have to maybe, get, um, take that one the, on notice. The Sorry. anonymous attendee will have to reveal themselves. Perhaps you'd yeah, like if, to they can, email. if they can just send us an email, we can we can stay anonymous. But they'll they'll just have to send me an email. So if you can send them my email, Richard, I'm happy to respond to Tanzania. Thank you, emails on this. Yeah, uh, we we uh, we have Earth Systems has an office in Kigali, in Rwanda. So I think we have a guy there who'll be able to tell me this answer pretty quickly because I've completely forgotten, and it would take me a bit of messing about to remember. No worries. Well, that's it for today's webinar. Thanks very much, everyone, for attending, and a really big thank you to David. Um, David, that was excellent, and obviously you're a real specialist in this area. And a big thank you to Earth Systems. That's the second webinar this in this webinar season. So many thanks for your contribution and sharing your knowledge. No problems. Did we go very far over time, Richard? <laughs> Well, we always go over time. Oh, uh, good, good. This time I'm we've only gone on. half an hour over. So Brilliant. Comprehensive. Excellent work. All right. Great, great. I'm happy. I hope everybody else is happy. And if you want to, if anybody has follow-up questions, feel free to email them to me and I'll, I'll try to deal with them as they come through. Thanks, David. Really Thanks, Richard. It. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you later. All right.